Winston Churchill in Morocco. Um, it really became his most famous, uh, favored winter destination, particularly after the Second World War. It was a place where he worked and a place where he played uh, as well. And what I want to do this morning is to tell you a little bit about the story of his visits to Morocco uh, through a lot of his own words, um, since uh, you know he is going to say it much better than I can ever say it to you. He, um, there we go. He made uh, six real visits to Morocco. Uh, the last in 1960, he was just diverted by a plane from Gibraltar and was in Tangier uh, overnight when he was en route to Aristotle Onassis's uh, yacht. Uh, his second visit in uh, 1943, January of 1943, was for the Casablanca Conference uh, with uh, Franklin Roosevelt. At the end of the year, he convalesced in Marrakesh, uh, having caught pneumonia, and his wife Clementine joined him on that particular trip. Um, he went after the war from uh, December 47 to January 48 uh, to, uh, to paint and also to work on his Second World War uh, memoirs. And he was in Marrakesh for that, as he was for the later visit in, uh, over Christmas and New Year of December 50 and 51. Um, again, Clementine joined with him on that latter visit. Uh, in 19, January 1959, uh, he went for another visit uh, with Clementine to go and paint, um, and it really did become his uh, favorite place. I, uh, part of the attraction, I think, in the beginning for going to Morocco was that he'd spent a lot of time painting in the south of France. Uh, of the more than 500 paintings that he did, uh, approximately 300 of them were completed in the south of France, and I think maybe he ran out of people to stay with and needed another, <laughs> another place uh, to go. On that first visit uh, in 1935-1936, uh, um, he, he visited much of the country. Um, he visited some other places that aren't listed on the map, like Meknes. Um, but um, apart from uh, his uh, January 1943 visit with Franklin Roosevelt, uh, Marrakesh really uh, was where he had um, his base. After his uh, visit, his first visit, uh, he wrote this uh, remarkable article in the Daily Mail, uh, absolutely fascinating. And uh, not only with the headline, I was astonished by Morocco, but he begins by saying, Morocco to me was a revelation. And he went on and said that reading about the country affords not the slightest impression of the charm and value of this splendid territory. He goes on later in the article, he says, here we have a region larger than England, gifted with a rich and fertile soil, an adequate rainfall, and a climate which, in spite of four hot months, is admirably fitted for European residents and settlers. The great undulating plains of black or red earth, which require only organized irrigation to make them bear abundant crops, surround the traveler on every side. He described the places that he visited as being of the highest order and said that thought, organization, and willpower have been lavished upon creating a first-class tourist structure. And hopefully those of you going on the 3D journey uh, to uh, Morocco uh, will find that that uh, is still the case. But of, of everywhere in the country, uh, it really was Marrakesh that uh, captured his heart. He said in this article, I must confess myself captivated by Marrakesh. Here in these spacious palm groves, rising from the desert, the traveler can be sure of perennial sunshine, of every comfort and diversion, and can contemplate with ceaseless satisfaction the stately snow-clad panorama of the Atlas Mountains. The sun is brilliant and warm, but not scorching. The air crisp, bracing without being chilly. The days bright the night's cool and fresh. And in uh, peacetime, the uh, La Mamounia Hotel became uh, his uh, Marrakesh headquarters. Um, so in 1935, he arrived in Tangier, um, where John Churchill, uh, the first Duke of Marlborough, later the first Duke of Marlborough, had served for three years as a young officer in the late 17th century. But it wasn't really a very good uh, start for him. Uh, he was there in search of sunshine, and the sun uh, was not there. And he wrote to Clementine, saying uh, some days later that they'd left for Marrakesh uh, in search of the sun. He described the journey saying, we've had a very interesting drive through this moist, green, fertile, temperate, and sparsely populated land. Um, but triumphantly arriving in Marrakesh, he declared to Clementine, at last the sun. I thought we should never overtake it. 
But Churchill was captivated from the outset. He wrote a, uh, a few days later to Clementine saying, this is a wonderful place and the hotel one of the best I have ever used. I have an excellent bedroom and bathroom with a large balcony, 12 foot deep, looking out on a truly remarkable panorama over the tops of orange trees and olives and the houses and ramparts of the native Marrakesh. And like a great wall to the eastward, the snow-clad range of the Atlas Mountains. Some of them are nearly 14,000 feet high. The light at dawn and sunset upon the snows, even at 60 miles distance, is as good as any snowscape I have ever seen. And I'm sure those are the uh, types of views that you will have on this, uh, on this journey. No pressure to the people organizing the uh, 3D <laughs> visit. I have no plans and propose to stay here till I get bored. I spend the whole day painting and on Marlborough, apart from eating and drinking. Um, this was a, uh, a trip that my uh, newly uh, married grandparents joined him on, and uh, uh, it was like a second honeymoon to them. Uh, Churchill wrote in one letter about how they were reading political books to each other uh, under, uh, under the tree. And he, my grandfather also painted uh, with his father-in-law, and one of my most prized possessions is uh, the, uh, one of the paintings that he completed in Marrakesh um, alongside Churchill in January of 1936. So on the day that he arrived in Marrakesh, uh, Churchill told his wife, I'm painting a picture from the balcony, because although the native city is full of attractive spots, the crowds, the smells, and the general discomfort for painting have repelled me. But it appears that this didn't last too long, um, because he did, spend, uh, he did paint some pictures from the city. This was one of them that he did, and then another one called The Gate um, at Marrakesh. It also seems that they made some day trips uh, outside of Marrakesh uh, because he painted this, which is uh, entitled a, a North African Town. Churchill's next visit was uh, in 1943. Uh, January of 1943, he met Roosevelt there for the Casablanca Conference. Uh, Stalin was supposed to join them, but there was uh, uh, some fighting outside uh, of Stalingrad, and he uh, uh, didn't feel able to leave the country um, at that time. Uh, Casablanca was uh, the place where they decided on the timing of D-Day, uh, a consequential moment in the Second World War. And the conference took place uh, at the Hotel Danfa, and more uh, about that later. Uh, Morocco being a French colony, um, uh, General de Gaulle was there, and also Giro was there as well. They didn't get on, and they were trying to bring the two of them together was one of the tasks of the, uh, uh, of, of the conference. Uh, but Churchill went and inspected uh, some French uh, troops um, while there, and these are one of the few photos of him uh, in color um, from uh, during the Second World War. But at the end of the 10 days that they had been in uh, conference in Casablanca, they held a press conference. And after the press conference, Churchill turned to Roosevelt and he said, you can't come all this way to North Africa without seeing Marrakesh. I must be with you when you see the sun set on the snows of the Atlas Mountains. And so he convinced the president to uh, drive with him 150 miles over the desert uh, to, uh, to Marrakesh. They were protected by uh, troops just coming out of nowhere in the desert and by uh, planes flying uh, ceaselessly, as he put it, uh, overhead. And they arrived uh, in Marrakesh at the US Vice Consul's residence, uh, Villa Taylor. Uh, which he later described to Clementine as being a fairyland villa, uh, which had a tower overlooking the city and the mountains. And it was here that uh, it was here that Churchill arranged for Roosevelt to be taken up to the top of the tower. He was carried by two men um, and watched the sunset. And FDR really was captivated and caught uh, in the moment uh, by this, with Churchill explaining to him uh, what it was that uh, he should be looking out for, because Churchill, the painter, uh, was seeing much more of the sunset and, and the detail of it, and letting his friend uh, enjoy that moment. And so much so that at one point, um, at one point, uh, Roosevelt turned to Churchill and he said, I feel like a sultan. You may kiss my hand, my dear. <laughs> So 
So uh, he, they had a jolly dinner uh, that followed, uh, lots of singing apparently. Uh, Churchill said that he thought that uh, uh, Roosevelt was about to sing a solo, and, uh, but then it didn't happen, or he didn't recall it. Um, and the next morning, uh, Churchill took uh, uh, Roosevelt to the airport um, in his siren suit, uh, which uh, might be known as the, the forerunner of, uh, of the onesie. <laughs> but he returned to, uh, he returned to uh, the villa and he painted the only picture that he painted during the Second World War, which he gave to FDR to memorialize the moment to ensure that uh, Roosevelt didn't change his mind about D-Day starting in 1944. Um, I will say that this painting um, is now owned by uh, one Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie. And given that what's going on, we're hoping that Sol Solomon's wisdom is not going to prevail uh, on the division of uh, property in their divorce. In um, December of 1943, having been uh, on a massive uh, Middle Eastern tour um, and North African tour, uh, Churchill caught pneumonia and was uh, needed a place for con convalescence. Uh, he uh, settled on Marrakesh back at the Villa Taylor and he wrote that I saw in my beloved Marrakesh a haven where I could regain my strength. He also, it seems, they, seems that they had rather a fun time while they, uh, while they were there because um, he, uh, well, he, uh, he seemed to go on a few picnics. He wrote in his war mem memoirs, he said, we all lunched by the side of a dazzling stream in fresh air and brilliant sunshine. It was indeed an oasis in the vast desert of human conflict through which we had to toil. So his next, uh, his next visit was in December of 1947. Um, this was uh, a visit which was to, intended to quicken progress uh, on the f uh, volume one of his war memoirs. And uh, his American publishers, the representative uh, Walter Grabner, um, had convinced his superiors uh, in New York uh, to pay for a working holiday in the winter sunshine for Churchill, uh, away from politics and away from other distractions, in order that they could get this first uh, volume uh, out. He reported back to them, having put it to Winston Churchill, that Mr. Church, unsurprisingly, Mr. Churchill agrees with our suggestion that it would be in the interests of time life to go to Marrakesh this winter to work. He gladly accepts our proposal to pay his expenses. <laughs> this is the sort of holidays that uh, everybody wants, just nice work if you can get it. Um, and uh, Churchill wrote to, uh, to his wife Clementine uh, quite triumphantly about uh, this arrangement. He said, uh, when you recollect how much it means to all these publishers to get delivery of volume one by the end of February, and that they would perhaps lose many thousands of pounds and suffer immense inconvenience if I failed them, I feel fully justified in the course I have taken, which results only from the fact our own currency regulations, which prevent me from using my own money. <laughs> now it seems that Mr. Grabner was not fully versed in a Churchillian lifestyle, um, uh, nor in the fact that Winston Churchill once said that I am a man of simple tastes, I am easily satisfied by the best. <laughs> So to get around the exchange controls, Time Life uh, wired money to uh, the Mamunia for him. The equivalent in today's money of $100,000 was wired for seven people for five weeks. Um, but Churchill, and this probably was a silly thing to say to him, was told by Mr. Grabner, there is plenty more if necessary. <laughs> so before, so they arrived in the middle of December. A few weeks later, in the middle of January, uh, before Mr. Grabner had arrived, uh, Churchill had already made a request for the equivalent of another 50,000. When Mr. Grabner arrived, a further request for the equivalent of $15,000 was made. And at the end of the stay, they were $20,000 short on the bill, and the entire visit had cost time life about 150000 now, Churchill's uh, main researcher at the time, Bill Deakin, uh, he wasn't sure that the publishers had received full value. He felt that Churchill had painted more than he had worked. And rather amusingly, one of his secretaries, Miss Sturdy, she reported in a letter home, the money here aren't half going. 
So uh, quite clearly they were they, quite clearly they were living it up. But he did paint uh, some attractive pictures while he was uh, while he was there in uh, Marrakesh. Uh, this is one that uh, had gone uh, missing uh, many years ago. He had given it uh, to Bernard Baruch uh, in South Carolina, and it turned up uh, uh, just before the exhibition that I co-organized in Atlanta a few years ago. We found it and was very pleased to find it. Um, the, another one, this one is owned by uh, Randolph Churchill, one of my fellow great-grandsons. Um, and then this one of Marrakesh, which uh, he painted uh, for and gave to President Truman um, in the late 1940s. Now, he gave this painting, which if you came to the Atlanta exhibition, you would have seen to President Eisenhower. And uh, this is the Valley of the Eureka, and he described going to this location. Uh, we went to Eureka, where the river comes out of the mountains and the pebbles. Um, he returned again to Marrakesh in, uh, for Christmas and New Year in 1950 and 51, where he painted this picture, which is um, at Teneria. And he said, we have found a sunlight painting paradise at Teneria. And he gave this one to General George Marshall. And I just stop for a moment to say that, to me, it's quite interesting that uh, in these four great men uh, in uh, wartime and post-war time, uh, in the post-war time world. Winston Churchill gave each of them a, a Moroccan scene to President Roosevelt, uh, Truman, Eisenhower, and General Marshall. And um, on his last two trips in uh, 1950 and 51 and 1959, he stayed at the Mamounia again. And this is one that of his uh, later pictures of the garden at La Mamounia. Um, but interestingly, initially in 1950, when he decided to go, uh, the hotel was full. But the manager promised uh, rooms by cancelling uh, bookings, uh, or as he put it, if necessary, turning people out. <laughs> I will tell you that as a great grandson of Winston Churchill, that uh, uh, ability to uh, find hotel rooms does not exist uh, uh, for me. So um, one lasting friendship that uh, Churchill developed uh, that started in 1935 until the Pasha's death in 1956 was with uh, uh, Thami El-Ghlaoui. Uh, he was a, a generous host uh, to Winston Churchill. And in fact, uh, his daughter Sarah, was, uh, she, she wrote in a letter home on one trip um, about some of the hospitality that they had had. She said, I have been commanded by Papa to write to you all a full description of the dinner. It really was a most sumptuous evening. We sat around a low table, the juniors on poofs, and Papa and the Glowy on a low sofa. Servants padded about, carrying to and fro great copper and earthenware bowls and plates of food. Much of the dinner was eaten Arab style with the fingers, but occasionally it was correct to use a spoon. Papa committed one social error by plunging his hand into a great bowl, only to be handed a spoon. Later, somewhere about the 10th course, an ice cream turned up. I am sorry to say that though it was quite clear that this was one of the courses to be eaten with a spoon, Papa was enjoying himself so, so much that muttering, I simply must, he plunged his fingers into the ice cream. <laughs> the Glowy and son were highly amused, an Arabian night to be sure. But I think that one of the, um, I think one of the other things that might have attracted him, uh, not only was uh, El Glaoui the uh, Pasha of Marrakesh, he also had the uh, unofficial uh, titles, the Lord of the High Atlas and the Black Panther. And for someone who liked, uh, you know, words and liked titles and, and, and hats and just uniforms and everything like that, I think that that was another thing that he probably saw uh, uh, in uh, his friendship with, with this man. But um, one of the more interesting uh, things that came out of this uh, was um, that through Winston Churchill's influence and his love of painting, he prevailed a change of mind uh, on uh, the Pasha's son, uh, Hassan's 
decide, um, desired career of becoming a professional artist. And the Pasha's granddaughter, uh, she said some years later that uh, during the Second World War, the young Hassan received his first real encouragement to follow his chosen career as a painter. When Winston Churchill, who was convalescing in Marrakesh, was shown some of his sketches by his father. The Pasha, uh, by the way, the father Pasha, Churchill dissolved his father's opposition by advising that his son be sent to study art seriously. Hassan then went to Paris, where he studied and worked for 15 years. And a wonderful footnote of this was about 15 years ago uh, in London. Uh, one of my aunts organized an exhibition of Hassan al glawis paintings to hang alongside some of Winston Churchill's paintings of Marrakesh. And I think that uh, that is something that uh, Churchill himself would have uh, been quite pleased to, uh, to see happen all these years later. So before I give some final um, Churchillian advice on, uh, on Morocco, um, I do just want to say that um, uh, his description of Marrakesh was as the Paris of Sahara. And I noticed that uh, on the itinerary for this trip, uh, you do have a day of uh, sightseeing uh, in Marrakesh at, uh, I think it says, at leisure. And so perhaps uh, listening to what Churchill wrote about Marrakesh uh, might give you some ideas. He said Marrakesh was the Paris of the Sahara, where all the caravans had come from Central Africa for centuries to be heavily taxed en route by the tribes in the mountains and afterwards swindled in the Marrakesh markets, receiving the return which they greatly valued of the gay life of the city, including fortune tellers, snake charmers, masses of food of drink, and on the whole, the largest and most elaborately organized brothels in the African continent. All these institutions were of long and ancient repute. So if you're stuck for things to do in, in Marrakesh. <laughs> but then also uh, some advice that he gave to his private secretary as some final Chichilin advice. Go and put on something warm. They say of the breeze off the atlas that it is too gentle to blow out a candle, but strong enough to snuff out the life of a man. And so I leave you with a picture of a contented Winston Churchill in the 1950s painting away uh, in, in Marrakesh. And what the, one of the interesting things about this photograph is that in one of his paintings of Marrakesh, uh, this man with the horse and, uh, and cart uh, turns up. And I wonder whether Churchill just asked him to stop until he'd finished painting him, which he might, which he might well have done. But thank you very much, and I hope those of you who go on the trip uh, will have a wonderful time in Morocco. Thank you.